Hi, Nick. It's so nice to see you again. But um, as you write in your book, much has changed in the past few years regarding the health care of dogs, uh, especially what it means to be geriatric. You want to explain that? Well, I think it's true to say that uh, veterinary medicine is now more advanced than it's ever been. And because of the good care, and perhaps because of good nutrition, and because perhaps of the way people feel about pets these days and their willingness to invest time and money in the facilities that are available, um, pets are living longer. So just like the human population, it's sort of skewing to the right with fortunately an increased number of elderly pets who for the most part can enjoy the senior years and they make terrific pets and they're in great numbers. Um, but the thing is sometimes things go wrong. So we wrote the book, uh, Good Old Dog, to help people with those issues. No, I think it's a marvelous book, by the way. Uh, I mean, it's a good read, besides being very informative. Um, uh, but we all want our dogs to live as long as possible. Can you recommend some preventive practices that will enable us to you know, see our dogs into their golden years? Well, the most important thing, really, uh, just to name one single um, element that's is quite uh, basic, and that is um, don't overfeed them. So it's been known from the turn of last century that uh, the single most important um, dietary factor in longevity and a, a major factor in longevity period is the number of calories that cross the back of your throat or your dog's throat. So if the dog overeats and gains weight, that is a sure way to shorten his life. It's more important than any individual nutrient is the total calorific intake. So if we can keep our dogs the right shape, and in the book there's a chart to show you right. what the right shape is. It's a Purina chart for assessing whether your dog's the right weight or, or not. Um, and you try and keep them on track by feeding them the right amount of the right food, and you make sure they have plenty of exercise. Um, those things together will make sure that your dog is on the, the right track. Of course, you also have to uh, prevent um, disease, um, which can shorten life suddenly. And lots of things you can do things about. There's lots of preventive medicine, and everybody's super aware already of vaccination, but perhaps they're not quite so aware of the fact that our older canine companions need to be vaccinated at least as much, if not a little more, because they have failing immune systems. Yeah, that surprised me in the book because most people think they can taper off as the dog grows older, but you said quite the opposite. You want to little broaden that a little bit, say more about it? Um, well, the thing is that as we and our dogs get older, um, you know, even if we're supposed you know, what's called successful ages, and our dogs are successful ages, that they don't have any particular health problems, uh, systems do slow down from brain to heart to lungs to livers and kidneys. Everything's working a little less efficiently. Uh, and that includes the immune system. So you're less able to combat um, various, say, infectious elements that come along. Um, and actually less able to deal with, um, you know, these naughty little cancer cells that come along, which normally get wiped out. Um, so various things go wrong. Immune system being down a bit means that we need to uh, make sure that the dogs are thoroughly vaccinated, regularly vaccinated, right up to through old age, so that anybody is to help them with the fight and their systems just need a little help to get there, uh, more so than, say, the uh, bouncing around one or two-year-old. Okay, okay. Uh, well... I've got to say I'm going to say that you know, this book, um, although I am the editor and I was responsible, you know, for part responsible for the conception of the book, uh, right from the drawing board, and I am the editor and a contributor and do the media for the school, the fact is there are um, seven or so really talented board certified individuals who lent their total wealth of specialist uh, information and input to this book, 
And then it was written in jaunty fashion by Larry Lindner, who is a, right. former, a New York Times best-selling author, wrote some books for Miriam Milson, the Strong Women series. And uh, so he's an accomplished writer, and we have the expertise. And actually, when I'm editing this book, when I was editing it, there's things in there that I'm learning about oh. all adults, because I, I'm not an expert on, you know, state-of-the-art cancer treatment or, or, you know, what's brand new in treating arthritis. So I'm reading and I'm learning what my fellow colleague experts write. No, I appreciated that, especially now that you mentioned they were board certified. I, I certainly know that they were specialists, but that brings up a question, too, of just in a general sense, not just with senior dogs, but when is it the best time to to have a dog go to a specialist versus just a GP, just a general vet? Well, it's a sort of judgment call, really, that you can make along with your local vet. And vets these days aren't too shy if you ask for a referral. And it used to be in the early days of specialization that uh, some of them were a little bit um, miffed, like, you know, well, you know, you don't trust me to handle this issue. <laughs> right. But the fact is, you can't be an expert in everything. And, and I have a, a doctor um, who looks after my health. And I, and I know he's an excellent generalist. And um, we sit and talk about various issues. But is there something that's, um, you know, just a little bit beyond the generalist um, input? I mean, if an eye condition is something a little bit more than eye drops or eye ointment or you know, something a little bit tricky that he sees with an ophthalmoscope, he wouldn't have any hesitation and would lose no pride at all in sending me to the specialist, whether it was an orthopedic thing or a skin issue. And it's the same with veterinary medicine now. Um, you know, just take one specialty, surgery. Um, yeah. Sure, local vets uh, do castrations and spays and lump removals and this, that, and the other, and cut pads and so on. They might even do it go a little bit further. But the fact is, if you want a total hip replacement or a knee, you, you may find a practice who happens to have a person who's not board certified but has specialized in that surgery. But most people wouldn't feel comfortable doing that. And most vets would be very happy to punt it to someone who's an, right. an expert in that area. Well, I, I know in, in just the people I know who have gone to a general practitioner for surgery, which is, like you're saying, removing a lump. I know one person, actually, whose dog died because the dog stood up too quickly after recovering from the anesthesia and died, died in the crate. So I think that probably would not have happened if he had taken the dog to a specialist who had better care in terms of, you know, post-operative care. What was that surgery that uh, that dog had, Claudia? Just a little lump on her vagina. It was just a little mm -hmm. lump removed. But uh, oh. either the dog didn't get the right kind of anesthesia or, it, or the fact that no one was watching the dog after, which I know in a lot of uh, surgical practices, they, they take greater care with such things. But anyway, that's... That Let's, let's get back to the seniors. I have a senior. I have a 17-year-old. I'm very proud I have a 17-year-old little dog, but it's a little terrier mix who probably is going through canine dementia now. And your book was very helpful in trying to analyze that, but if the dog doesn't follow all the, the D-I-S-H, the DISH uh, mm. symptoms, can they still have dementia if they don't have them all? Uh, sure. I mean, if you uh, we have that chart, of course, in the yeah. book, um, modified, we think even slightly better than the one that's on the Pfizer Animal Health website. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it's it's a guide. Um, uh, Pfizer would have you believe that um, if you filled in the chart that checks in any one of those boxes mean that the dog has dementia. Um, I think it requires a, a critical eye. Um, to look at the checks, and it could be that if all the checks were in one box, it could be that the dog does have dementia, but I prefer to see checks in two boxes. Um, it's not sufficient, for example, you know, the H of the DISH, or the DISHER acronym, is house soiling, and right. um, it's a pretty uh, good giveaway that if a dog who is 13 or 17, in your case, um, is having accidents around the house, and if there is no medical reason whatsoever, there's no diabetes, no renal disease, 
no um, no cystitis, uh, you know, nothing. Um, the vet's drawing a complete blank, doing all of the tests. And no, it's not that annoying post-spay, leaking, incontinence type behavior. Um, by elimination in a previously house-trained dog, that one sign alone might be enough to, to, to give the dog a diagnosis. Okay. Um, on the other hand, you know, in the S of the dish area, sleep disturbances, if your older dog is sleeping more than usual, um, you got to check in that box and that may not be a, a sign. But if he's very anxious at night, um, that might be more relevant. So it's a question of reading the checks, reading the boxes. So people can fill that chart in themselves, get an idea, um, don't make the diagnosis. If you've got any concerns, bring it to your vet and hopefully he or she will have a good idea how to interpret it. Or go to a specialist. Um, right. we, we do have a service called VetFax, ah. which is available to vets across the country and actually across the world. I've done consultations through VetFax with um, you know, Italy and Germany and Japan and Australia, uh, all over and coast to coast, north to south in this country. So if a vet is sitting there stroking the chin going, I don't know, maybe it is, but maybe it isn't. I know. I'll ask someone who's very familiar with this. And what they do is they do operate this vet fax service, which um, you can activate by just contacting you know, my office, my secretary, Ronnie Tinker. I can even give you a phone number if you wish. Um, they contact the officer, they'd like to do vet fax, and the rest of it is on rails. If you're, they, the vet is sent the forms, there's a certain set fee, we analyze every case, it's a customized response, and now you're working with a specialist remotely, with okay. a doctor, doctor, patient, client relationship. You talked about geriatric uh, separation anxiety. Is that part yeah. of the dementia equation, or is that something separate? That's something separate. So. That was something that I am proud to say I absolutely believe that I discovered on my own. And it all started with an Afghan hound who was elderly and could not sleep at night, but showed no signs of dementia. Bright eyed, uh, you know, actually switched on, kind of hypervigilant, didn't miss a trick, knew its name, followed its own around the house, greeted them when they came home. Everything was normal about this dog. It just didn't sleep at night. And I didn't know what it was. So I treated it for anxiety and had it palliated. And then one day, um, some months later, it was just walking around and its legs snapped in half. And what it had was a bone tumor. So even though all the Tufts internal medicine experts had poured over this dog, you don't typically do a bone scan as part of a routine evaluation, even of an elderly dog. So when we did the scan afterwards, all its bones were moth-eaten and that was the accounting for it. So there was a bone tumor causing this dog to become anxious only at night. Since then, I've seen you know, scores of these cases. When you know what you're looking for, you find it more often. And it, mostly it is uh, a tumor of some sort, which doesn't mean it's um, untreatable, uh, but some kind of cancer causing discomfort. And I was pleased to say, discovered just fairly recently, that they have a similar handout for mothers of children at the Dana-Farber hospital for children where they um, they have cancer. If a child has cancer, supported perhaps by the Jimmy Fund around here, um, they give the mother a handout. It's that common and says, you've got to expect your child to be particularly anxious at night because at night, all the pain and the throbbing and the discomfort is much worse than when it's kind of s sort of smoothed over during the day with things that are going on. But when you're alone at night with your pain or your discomfort and mommy or daddy is asleep, everything seems so much worse. So nocturnal anxiety, sleeplessness, restlessness, while it can be part of the Alzheimer's syndrome, the so-called sundowner part of it, it's also, if it's standalone, it can be a sign of something serious and uncomfortable going on um, in the dog's body. Yeah, no, that was fascinating because, again, back to my little 17-year-old, he likes to walk around at night. I mean, he sleeps, obviously, a lot. But at night, he'll get up and you hear his little paws going around the house, going around in circles. And it's uh, disconcerting because I, I feel like there's something, you know, anxious about him. And I don't know what to do. I try to put him into bed with me, but he just wants to walk around, you know. But So mm -hmm. it could be a little bit of the both, you know, that he's got the, the, the 
geriatric anxiety, but also perhaps dementia. But, you know, Does at 17, you know, what can one say, you know? Does he have any other signs of... Um, well, he's got very much like the signs you talked about in the book. He, he goes into corners. He, uh -huh. Yeah, he to, when you open the door, he goes the wrong way. You know, the, all those little, he's, he's also probably very blind and mostly deaf. Uh, but he just recently also has been eating well. But that was another question I had because there for a while, you know, I've had many senior dogs and it was always hard to make them eat, even though I cook chicken for them and do all the nice things to make it appetizing. So what are the best ways to get a, a senior dog interested in food? Uh, well, there are several things that you can do. Um, some of them are just tricks, really. Um, sometimes dogs will prefer wet food over dry food, and sometimes you can make the dry food more appetizing by putting a dot of wet food on top of it or you can even just add hot water to the dry oh. food to bring out the aromas um, you could try feeding them out of a different bowl you know some mm -hmm. dogs will often uh, they'll eat off your plate mm -hmm. uh, but they're not so happy out of eating out of a dog bowl so you can kind of fake them out that way um, you can try um, adding some little bacon slices you know mm. sort of jimmies as it were you know sort of things that you might sprinkle on a salad Right. or a little bit of cheese. I mean, there's all kinds of ways of attracting them to get going. And there are also ways that you can kickstart them with medicines. So, uh, you know, a medicine like um, cyproheptadine is a good appetite stimulant um, if you need a kickstart. I mean, it's right. not for long term. Or even one of the Valium type drugs will uh, get the engine going again. Huh. I know you mentioned in your book another, uh, two very helpful things to me was to elevate their bowl and so i have a little stool a little tiny table for lenny because he's a small dog so he doesn't have to bend down for the food you know well, that's true it's clear if he has any neck pain or yeah that's another not helpful thing yes and then you also mentioned that uh perhaps you actually do feed them while you're eating or directly after like you know at the table not at the table but obviously while you're eating to get them. I thought you had very interesting little tips like that. I thought, yes, that, that makes sense. Uh, but, the, but the little stool was a great idea. Uh, also because a senior dog, oh, a lot of dogs, they slip and slide as they're trying to eat, right? Their legs go out under them because the floor is slippery. But if you put a little, a little rug and a little stool and you put their food on it, it makes it much better. And so at least Lenny's been... He's been eating lately, and I think it was thanks to your book, so I do want to thank you about that little helpful tip. Well, that's great. Um, thank you for that feedback. Um, it is uh, you know, sad how sometimes their appetite does fade, and of course, um, latterly, you know, one of the things that happens to us all and our dogs is that you know, in, the, in them days, at the end of one's time, appetite often does just shut off. And yeah. You know, in uh, cancer, for example, there are uh, things produced, uh, chemicals produced by the cancer, which suppress appetite, and you just kind of shut down and fade away, and that's a common end-of-the-line situation in hospice. Right. Well, the, the fading away is the next question I have for you, because all of us obviously want our dogs to have a peaceful death, and we all dream of dogs dying in their sleep, right? Passing away s gently. But that's, as you mentioned right. in the book, that's rarely the case. Absolutely. So, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, there's the good death and the bad death. And the good death is one that is fairly rapid, but uh, that doesn't even necessarily mean that there's going to be no pain or discomfort, um, you know, in the last few hours. And the bad death, you know, for us too, is one where you've, got a, a sentence of something awful like a brain cancer and you just know that uh, you know it's going to destroy you or your dog um, because you've been told about the level of the malignancy and the extent of it and and then you just got to sit there and go through it but there comes a point when you say you know the quality of life is now not what it should be at least with an animal you can do that and say um, should they 
stay awake in pain with no appetite and no pleasure, no joy in life at all, just surviving, not really living. And the answer to that is really not. And, you know, if I was the dog, um, I would appreciate a magic carpet ride, you know, just to close my eyes and slip into the blue yonder without having to experience the last couple of months of misery with no pleasure.